There we go. Yeah, thanks. It's, it, was that a compliment on the bedroom from our guest, uh, Chris <laughs> Wallace, joined us on our live stream. As we've been promising you, uh, during the lockdown, we've been, I guess, catching up with New Zealand well, legends, really, to find out what they're up to and pick their brain. We'll call it Lockdown Lessons. And as I said, Chris Wallace on the line. How are you doing, Chris? You've joined us from Sydney. Thanks for making some time for us. Uh, absolute pleasure. No, everything's good over here. Um, yeah, I feel for everybody. Nope. We look like we Make might sure have temporarily lost right him. Thing here in Sydney or Australia, and we can um, keep racing going. I'm sure you're all watching it from the other side of the Tasman. That's yep. exactly right, mate. Um, it, it has it has been a bit tricky, and I suppose the obvious place to start. We're going to cover off a lot, as I said to you just before. We've got a lot of questions from a lot of different people that are keen observers of your career as it's developed in Australia. So we'll get to those. But I, I guess the obvious place to start is where we are right now. Um, COVID-19, gee whiz, it's, it's, sh it's shaken the snow globe up a bit, a bit, hasn't it, mate? How relieved with, were you that racing could continue in Australia and um, you guys could carry on doing what you do best? Yeah, well, it was a day-to-day -day proposition, and it still is now. We've got to respect that, but we didn't know what was going to happen and if, if racing did stop, could we continue training the horses? How long would we stop for? Uh, it was just an endless amount of things from obviously making sure your staff are kept in employment through to your family health, your own health. So uh, all those questions um, needed to be answered. And fortunately, um, we've shown cause that we can keep racing going and make a responsible job of it and make sure it's seen by the public as being safe and socially acceptable. Uh, a few little changes here and there and a, a few people being slapped over the knuckles in the early days, but everybody's understood it now and realised how serious it is. And it all came down to one thing, and that was obviously the numbers of the coronavirus and with them uh, steadily dropping, and, and now it seems to be under control, should I dare say it, um, I think racing will continue. But the one thing I could see if we stopped, there would have been so much pressure to stop it forever or until racing uh, or until all sports came online. So I think everybody's saying uh, well done to racing. Uh, but everybody's fighting to get back as soon as they can, but at the same time responsible for, obviously, the participants. Yeah, no doubt a pretty testing and trying time over there, mate. Um, we'll get straight into some of the gritty stuff. Last week we put 15 grand on Very Elegant, and we run second, obviously. Um, what can the lads back this weekend to recover some of that 15k? Wow, straight into it. Jeez, he doesn't muck around. Uh, yeah, he might have been a bit better going each way. She ran wow. a terrific race and probably the, the race of her life. Uh, yeah, it was good to see her separate the two international horses, the, the English horse, um, Adib, and, and obviously Dan and Premium, who, who ran third. So there was a lot of hype about the Japanese horse, and it was just good to see her for my sake. And I think for Australia and New Zealand's sake, that from a horse perspective, she, she got second, but not much good for the punters for the sound of it. So yeah, we, were, um, to, we, were greedy. we were greedy. We should have had a place bet, but we didn't. But. Yeah, I think it might have been better. If you did the form, you would have. <laughs> so um, I think <laughs> tomorrow, I think shared ambition's our best chance. He won't be paying great odds, but J-Max riding him and... Uh, He's got an awkward barrier, but he's a pretty good horse. Trainer made the wrong decision last start running in the Doncaster. He was in the wrong race, simple as that. But he's in the right race tomorrow, and he'll be in the spring going towards Caulfield and Melbourne Cup. So not just tomorrow, watch him in the spring as well. Chris, you've just added yourself pretty early on in the podcast, and this was one of the questions I was dying to ask you. How, how do you, how much, how much honesty do you possess within yourself when you get it wrong? And because I guess you are, you're a leader now. You're an industry leader. You have been for a long time. Are, are you good at copying it and saying, "Look, I, I actually got that one wrong, and this is why." We well, don't buy the newspaper on a Sunday after you've had a bad day. I've learned that pretty quick. Uh, and if it's a really bad day, you don't buy it Monday or Tuesday either. But you just start to tap in later in the week. So obviously, um, yeah, it's a it's a industry which um, which is uh, heavily scrutinised, and I respect that. And we're grateful for it in Australia. The media coverage is is fantastic, and it puts our sport right on the all the back pages 
of of this of the newspapers daily. So um, yeah, we've got to be grateful for that, and we've got to take the good with the bad. So um, I'll normally get told when when the team's out of form, or you're not going quite as well, or you can't do this, can't do that, or or um, you had too many beaten favourites. So <laughs> I'm pretty used to it, but uh, you own up to it, and I think that's the best way. That's what people people appreciate and um, yeah get on the front foot and tell people as things are happening I find has been a good thing throughout my career and um, people respect honesty I know that yeah for sure what one thing I wanted punters to ask are always right to the punters are always right yeah and until they're wrong yeah what well, a couple of burning questions I've had Chris um, obviously you trained a good horse called Winks we'll get to that a bit later but you've also trained a good one called Star of the Seas and still train Star of the Seas. Um, should should I be as confident and bullish about this horse or am I, am I reading into it that uh, maybe it's not quite as good as I think it is? Um, he was, yeah, it was running the Doncaster, finishing second. I think he was beating the neck, was outstanding. He's been a hard horse for us to get a gauge on. He what I call not a not a great doer. So uh, mm. while he was winning races in his early career and winning three or four in a row, um, at the same time he was leaving plenty of feed and and not being as big and strong as he should. So that's held him back. And all of a sudden he's up in the weights now, and he's he's basically a weight for age horse and probably half a length below one of those horses. So look, he's got a conditions to suit. Um, he's like most race horses; they need things to go their way. Um, had he had a better draw in the Doncaster, he wins it, and uh, instead he's run second, beaten by a 40 or 50 to 1 chance. So, yeah, yeah. he's he, he's the backbone of my stable, and he's how I got started. And through great prize money, they end up picking up a lot of money. He, he, he'll probably end up winning a million dollars, and um, he may not win a group one race. So, what does that tell you? Wow. Uh, Says the prize money is big in Australia, and it's something that, um, as you'd know, isn't reciprocated in New Zealand. Um, New Zealand's kind of at the moment with racing, Chris. I'm sure you keep a, a bit of an eye on it. No racing, it's tough, and it's gonna. It's been tough for a while, and it's gonna be tough whenever they come back. It's gonna look a lot different. Do you how, actually how closely do you follow New Zealand racing, and do you kind of do you still have observations and and kind of bits and bobs that you're interested in? Uh, I certainly do. It hurts me to know what's happening happened in New Zealand over the last 20 or 30 years. And But realistically, it would be the reason why I'm, why I'm here in Australia talking to you. Uh, if, it wasn't, if it was going a lot better, I, I wouldn't have come across here. So um, since I left, which was about 20 years ago, things haven't got any better. There was a glimpse of hope when they had, a, I think it was a $2 million derby and the, and the race at Hawke's Bay was worth a lot of money and things seemed to be going along okay. And it seemed that New Zealand owners were retaining horses. Next thing you're winning Caulfield Cups again and and bringing them over here and winning derbies and you still are now. So I just think the frequency is gonna become less and less and New Zealand will become forgotten. And it's a very sad thing to say, but it's true unless we, unless we all work together and get it yeah. sorted out. and. There'll have to be some harsh decisions made. You need government support. Until you get government support, it won't work. And the same, we've been through the same thing in, in Sydney. Uh, and the reason I say Sydney, because South Australia, they're struggling. Queensland's not much better. So we're in the same country and we've got one state, or well, two states, Victoria and New South Wales that are flying and two states that are, that are not much better than New Zealand, obviously a little bit better. Um, and yet two hours away in New Zealand, things are disastrous. So it all comes down to government support. The government got to understand how important racing is to an economy, how it is from a social perspective, as well as a, um, a economic perspective, uh, how much that dollar gets, keeps getting turned around, how many people it employs, casuals and full-time and as well as the breeding industry, which is diminishing, unfortunately. So it's, uh, yeah, you, you, I'd be concentrating on the government, not just the the the, the party in control, uh, which is obviously Labor at the moment, but you've got to get a, a strong opposition, both working, both wanting racing to exceed, not fighting against each other. 
And until you do that, you're no chance of getting ahead because you need government support. Yeah, mate, I think the downside to that as well is that because race is not taken as seriously here, um, it's hard for everyday public to understand some of the achievements that people like yourself make. Um, and I know you're a very modest man, but I think when I watch your career through that Winx era, I was pretty inspired at just how well you um, managed the whole process. And I was just thinking all the time how much pressure you have must have on you and how many people would be demanding your attention and these fly-by-nighters and just all these demands on you, but you still manage to stay, uh, you know, stable and get get the job done that was actually required. And long-winded question, um, but is that is that something that you kind of had to? You're lucky you're not. You're lucky you're not answering it to Donald Trump. He'd give it to you in both barrels. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so, what was my the second choice was 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 there was no second choice. We were. I've been given a great opportunity, don't bugger it up. And I was given a good horse to train. Don't dare bugger that up because you'd soon, soon, soon learn about it. So, um, I don't know. I'd just done everything the best I could. Um, still the same person I was 20 years ago. Um, Is that where you went to the box and athletics competitions back in the day or something? Is that where you learnt the, um, the, Skills. Well, that's where I learned to get beaten. Yeah. That's where I <laughs> <laughs> no. that winning wasn't everything. No. So, yeah, through coming to Australia, it, the thing I can vividly remember was how professional it was. So, um, little things like you can't make mistakes with the stewards. The stewards were very tough. Um, uh, your paperwork's got to be in order. You've got to make sure that this is done, that's done, and it flowed on to yeah. You, the owners of horses were um, wealthy business people that you got to mix with um, pretty early on, and that's what racing does attract. Is it attracts all walks of life, and I think that's what governments need to see. It's not just. Uh, a sport of kings. In fact, far from it these days with great syndicators and New Zealand's been doing a fantastic job with that, bringing more people into the sport. So what it brings is everybody together onto, onto a, a sporting field, all nationalities, all ages, all religions, everybody's together on a racetrack. Um, and the same with me training for these people. I get to speak to prime ministers, I get to speak to billionaires, I get to speak to just knock about blokes and, and their wives and, and what's going on in the world. So you learn pretty quickly off these types of people. And I think that's been a big thing for me. If I'd still been in Foxton, I might have run into the local service station owner or the publican or the, the TAB um, owner and, and things like that. But you don't get a chance to mix with the people that I've got to mix with. And it's amazing what you learn off successful people. And that's been a big part of me. And the majority of successful people that I've met are pretty humble people and we've had a bit of luck along our way and we don't take things for granted and you respect you respect where you come from and you never forget that. You, you say you've learned a lot from um, successful people and, and you would have had to because if you don't learn from those better than you then you, you're kind of missing a golden opportunity every time in any sector or industry but we know and you, it wasn't easy for you. It wasn't given to you. It wasn't served up on a platter. You know, your, the platform you've built. So how much of that journey of kind of being in Foxton, maybe not exceeding and excelling all the time and then step by step building what you have now, how, how much does that con contribute to your genuineness and kind of, I guess, the humility you, sh you showed throughout the whole Winx process? I think people kind of, they connected with you. There was a, there was a kind of a, almost like a trustworthiness because you just, you felt like a regular bloke. And, and how much do you think of where you came from contributed to that? A uh, big part for sure. So, um, yeah, I think one of um, a trainer's assets is obviously your, your horsemanship, or I would call it stockmanship. So being, being brought up on a farm was very important to me. Um, just what, what doesn't matter what animal it was, um, 
knowing how to look after them, care for them, seeing them when they're in a bit of pain or seeing them when they're unhappy or seeing what makes them happy and things like that was very important. I think work ethic is so important for any person and that's what helps you get ahead quickly. Um, I think, yeah, being getting to work earlier on time is a big thing, not having days off and all of a sudden you're quickly getting up the, up the ladder and you get given opportunities, you get given trust and all of a sudden it starts snowballing and you and you make ground quickly and um, I learned that early on and I try and install that in my staff as well. They see it, they appreciate it and if you're leading by example, I think it's a big thing when you're talking about a game with just small percentages. Um, I'm not that much, well, I wouldn't say I'm any better than other trainers. I'd simply say that we do things right and we try and make less mistakes than our competitors. So uh, this morning, for example, I was here, I wouldn't say I was the first one here, but I'd be in the first 10%. Um, I start at 3.45, I make sure I get here about 3.30. And there's some early risers there that get there before me, but I just want to be seen. I want to say hello to them. I want to say um, good morning. I want to look them in the eye to know that I'm here working with them as well. And uh, I think they appreciate that. And the times when you go away interstate, you might be away at a Flemington Carnival or Queensland, and you can see when you've been away for a week that uh, things can, can, can start to change pretty quickly. So I think being there, working with your team, and from my first day in work through to this morning, it hasn't changed, and you can see the benefit from it. And it's little things like that that, I think are important. Well, there's a lot of lessons that a lot of people listening can take from that. What's it like when you go back to Foxton now? Does everybody uh, know who you are? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I don't walk around no with uh, with um, with a sign on my head or anything like that. So <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I certainly still still know the people I went to went to school with or knew while I was in the town and uh, if I see them along the street I'll certainly say hello to them and, and vice versa. I uh, certainly don't get back there as much as I would like to. Uh, but the one thing I've noticed uh, each time I go back to New Zealand is how, how beautiful and clean it is. Um, whether it's a town like Foxton or whether it's Auckland, wherever it may be, Palmerston North, they're the, probably the main places I go to. Everybody looks after their backyard they look after their house and um, they're pretty proud of what they've got, so they should be. And um, Driving home tonight, you'll see the, the Aussies, they don't quite have that same care and attention to detail like a, a New Zealand homeowner would. And they're little things that stick out to me. And, and obviously, on a smaller scale, New Zealanders are very proud and I think they should be. And, and that's why it hurts for the racing just to be slipping behind a little bit because 20 years ago, uh, you were all the envy of Australia and everybody went to New Zealand to buy the best horses and Australia were doing their best to keep up and it's all of a sudden changed and we've got to, we've got to claw our way back. Well, it's, it's happy hour over here in New Zealand, Chris, on a Friday and everyone's in lockdown, so I don't know if happy hour kind of gets abolished because it's happy hour every day on a Friday, but we, we know that you've been up for, what is it, uh, close to 12 hours now, so we, we, we want to get into some other stuff because we can't keep you forever. I've got a Winx Carlton draft can here, but I don't think I'm going to open it because I don't want to, this is my last one and I want to keep it for, for a long well, time. Well, one too. Oh, there yeah. you go. That is fantastic. All right. Well, don't be afraid to crack it if you're allowed to treat I've got yourself. Pl there's plenty more still over here. Next time you come over here, we'll shout you, shout you a few. Okay, there you go. That's what we want to hear. Well, we won't be so careful with this one then. Um, look, Winx is a huge part of your journey, and we, we've got a ton of questions to get through on her. One for me to kick it off, and then we'll get into the punter's questions. When you yeah. hit when you hit that height, which is just like, I don't, I can't even, I wouldn't even have a clue what that felt like in the pinnacle of that. And then you go back to regular life when that last prep, so this time last year, Winx is, she's done racing. How do you go on with everyday life? And do you lack motivation or do you go, no, nah, actually, I want to do this again and I want to find the, the next best horse? How did that process work for you? Uh, it was an interesting stage of our life, that's for sure, because she, um, she took over our life for a good part of that 
time that she was in, in training and obviously not so much the first two years, but the last three years it did. And not every minute of the day, but every hour of the day, I guarantee I would have thought about weeks. <laughs> um, whether it's the first, it, it was the first thing you thought about when you woke up in the morning and it was the last thing you thought about when you went to bed. If you did that for a thousand nights and a thousand mornings, uh, it gives you some idea what's going on in your head when you're looking after a horse like that. And I think the same would have been for Hugh Bowman. The same would have been for her, her grooms uh, and a lot of my key staff. So obviously we had distractions um, by training some other good horses as well and many of them. So I think that was a good part of being able to have a little bit of a release as well as still going home and not worrying about racing too much. So um, that's the beauty of my, my relationship with my wife, uh, Stephanie. She, she doesn't really worry too much about racing. She'll go to the races a dozen times a year and whether we win or lose, it doesn't really change her too much and likewise with the kids. So that they knew what I was going through. They knew when to, um, my staff used to call it Winks Week. So they'd be, um, be, be hard to find actually. They wouldn't be, <laughs> they wouldn't be within, uh, within reach. And, um, yeah, it got quite, uh, secretly, but well known that Winks Week, uh, just, just be careful. Chris might be on his toes. <laughs> and, uh, as soon as she used to hit the line, um, after a win, well, after any race, uh, it was a big relief, but Sunday morning, as I said earlier, like the newspapers, that'd be, she was often on the front page, if not the back page or all through the paper. So straight away, you might have two or three weeks for a next race, but you're constantly thinking about it. So the answer, to answer your question, when she retired, uh, it, it, it was just an automatic relief. Uh, from the time she hit the front of that Queen Elizabeth. Uh, a bit of mopping up just to, to to look after her for a week and then send her out to the farm. So we just slowly decompressurized ourselves uh, from her. And and then week, two weeks went past. So the, I spoke at a, at a go local golf club about two weeks afterwards. I just cried the whole time. As soon as I mentioned her name, I just cried. Uh, whether it was talking about her first day in training, middle of her career, first win, last win, whatever it was, just cried the whole time. So um, that to me showed me I wasn't anywhere near over um, <laughs> weeks. And it slowly got better. We're a year year past it now. And things have got a lot better. Hugh Bowman was possibly worse. Um, I shouldn't speak out of school, but he took a break from break away from racing. Uh, it had just it had just taken over his his life, and um, look, he I think he dealt with it responsibly, but he was just wrecked, um, and he decided I want to break from racing. So I didn't have that choice. But like you've touched on, we did have a lot of other good horses, and I think that helped um, move on. And been to see her a few times since, and uh, there's no amazing emotion between us um i think she's got a rough idea who i am <laughs> well that's what i tell myself and and look can't wait to see her have a foal and uh we'll probably be pumped up and ready to handle the challenge of that responsibility wow that's uh yeah that's pretty special what what else did that era teach you um it taught me that she was part of property and that uh she was no longer ours, and we had to be very careful with the decisions we made, um, the way she was portrayed, and let everybody know as if they owned the horse themselves, uh, the public, I'm saying. And there was just so much expectation, not just through her winning, but promoting races, um, promoting racing. Uh, and there were some challenges along the way um, that I took to heart of some bad stories that go on in any sport and through racing. And it was like it was Winx's job to turn the bad page and open up the new page because she was just 
getting so much interest from first of all the racing uh, population next of all the sporting then it was the general public she was on the morning shows before races after races she was on front and back pages of newspapers and then it turned globally so um sounds, sounds like jacinda ardern pretty yeah <laughs> <laughs> Except everybody wanted Winks to win. Everybody loved Winks. I was saying that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's no politics involved in a fast horse, is there, Chris? Hey, not too look, much. Look, look, we've got so much. We've got so many questions, and I don't want to. I know people crafted these specially, and they wanted to hear your answers. So I want to get into them because right. um, look, the yeah, comments have been short, streaming. It. Yeah, answers. yeah. Let's 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 start to heat it up a little bit. Um, one that we got a lot. How close did you guys and the group, the ownership group, yourself, um, come to racing overseas? um not that close no we didn't say no straight away to whatever choice had to be made but we carefully thought about it we didn't kill the dream straight away but we responsibly answered it by saying look this is the negative of her going overseas and i've got no regrets i think we did the right thing from longevity point of view and if you'd given me a Royal Ascot win or a win in Dubai, Hong Kong, Japan, America, uh, over her longevity in winning a third Queen Elizabeth or 30, 30 odd wins in a row or a fourth box play, I would have never have taken any of those wins. And that's what kept coming back to me is why should she go to Royal Ascot? Why shouldn't she go to America? Why shouldn't she go to Japan or those other countries I mentioned? I think it was a little bit greedy for people just to say well let's take it to england mm. and forget the rest of the world just to tick one box yet she um she got the she got the um the following from the rest of the world and through uh social media or through um live coverage of races she was getting watched all around the world and i i don't think there was much criticism from outside of our own jurisdiction about her not traveling and people respected the reasons why did she have any quirks that people might not know about um not really she, she was straightforward oh, she yes. never had never had a cortisone injection she had one sore foot um in her 33 odd winning sequence she had a few problems before she got to the races including a sore foot um every time we used to give her a vaccination she used to get a she used to get sick and when i say sick she used to get a high temperature so every time we talked about going to or going overseas she used to get a vaccination and i used to dread the next day but we yeah. would do it while she was in 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 the spelling spelling farm so it mm -hmm. didn't affect with her training but no there was no no quirks um keep her to a simple routine don't don't over fuss about her and and she was just a machine when she was such a dedicated and focused horse um in her training she just was so so zoned in there was no mucking around she did things right but she was just so focused so every piece of work it was like she had her head down and she had a game face on but same as every start she had uh, even in the parade ring before races, she was just so switched on. There was no mucking around. Um, outside of that, she she was a kid's pony basically, but uh, a very delicate horse. She she wouldn't dare. You'll see some horses they're like thugs. They'll shoulder into you, <laughs> stand on your toe. I I used to basically for the cameras just walk in and out with her on those media mornings we had. I could dead set lead her with one finger on the bridle and she just she would never go that way or this way she she just knew what she was doing and she was just the proper princess that you'd expect to uh well not really expect the racehorse to be but she was dead set a1 student she's like a professional athlete i know you've called her that before and it's easy to see why last one on winks um could she uh moot point but could she have done another prep do you think she had the legs in her yeah, she could have, but we didn't want to see her get beaten. And uh, I said to the owners after the Cox Plate, um, maybe now's the time. And it wasn't because of 
her losing ability. We never saw that. We didn't see it once. Uh, it was just the fear of her hurting herself. Um, in her, I think it was in her last cops plate, I think there was only eight horses in it. Only six of them, only six of them um, pulled up sound. One of them, who I train now, Kings Will Dream, yeah. he fractured a pelvis and Humidor, I think, did a suspensory. Like, they, these horses, they put themselves under a lot of pressure and uh, if she had hurt herself, um, like any horse, it's, it's a very, very sad day, not just for, for racing, but for the staff at home. But with Wink, she had the following of the world. If something had happened to her, uh, it wouldn't have been the end of racing, but it wouldn't have been a pretty day and it would have been, it would have been remembered for a whole generation and, and instead, it wasn't. So they said to me, let's have another go. We'll have one more prep. And that's why she came back into the autumn and, and went through another three or four races. But uh, I can tell you, I was ready to stop <laughs> at the end of it. Sounds like it. Wow. Now, away from racing here quickly, you just got a couple of true, true or falses. Is it true that you're dating Miss Horopanua? <laughs> uh, now or back earlier on? Oh, is it a different person now? <laughs> no, that is true. Yes, yeah, Steph was uh, Miss Horrifanua. Uh, mm. And I think I met her before she was Miss Horrifanua. And oh. uh, well. as the story goes, I, I went to Miss Miss uh, Miss New Zealand and I think I think she ran third or something like that. <laughs> um, so I said, you didn't train so it, did you? Pretty good performance. I was batting well, well above my average, that's for sure. Well, mate, she... She met you before you were Sir Chris Waller. So uh, <laughs> here's, one, here's one. What outside of Wentz, what racehorse do you think put you on the map in Australia? Uh, in Australia, would have been Triple Honor. He won a Doncaster. It was my first Group One win, and it gave me the confidence to to say, "Well, gee, I, I, I can match it with the with the better trainers." So it was definitely him. But there were so many important wins along the way. Like my first winner was a horse called Party Bell. Opie Boston rode it actually. Won a 2100 metre race at Wyong. And who would have thought probably one of the worst races to win that things unfolded as they did. But that was an important win. And there's been so many along the years. But uh, yeah, knowing that you've arrived on that group one scene, it was a, it was a big, big, big uh, boost of confidence. Broad question here, Chris, but if you were looking back to a young Chris Waller trying to get into training and there's lots of Kiwis out there that, you know, aspire to be but you probably, frankly, what what piece of advice do you do you like to give? Uh, I'd say what I said at the start, just you've just got to work hard and just take small steps, but be consistent with what you do. It'll be frustrating because you'll see others go well beyond you for in a short space of time but you'll gradually catch up and, and you'll take over because, yeah, you see some lucky stories and you see some overnight successes. But, um, gee, I, it took me probably 10 years to train a Group 1 winner. Um, and those first five years, there would have been no chance. But once you've got the volume, uh, it comes a bit quicker. And But it's just working your way up to that. But I think don't set goals because you'll get disappointed in racing. But just keep track of where you're going and just small steps. Like every year in Sydney for us has been a good year. I'd say we would, my first year probably had five or six winners. Next thing it was eight or nine. Next thing it was 12 or 14. Next thing it was 20. And 20 winners in Sydney is almost putting in the top 10 of a trainer's premiership. And once you get there, you can quickly take steps. And so my advice is just, just stick at what you're doing continue to try and better yourself but don't set yourself unrealistic goals all right i better reset a couple of these goals by the looks uh million might not be so soon um what's a piece of advice that you've received that you've always taken on board and it's always stayed with you uh i just keep coming back to it it's really simple just be consistent be who mm. you are and be honest yeah there's no such thing as a quick buck and it soon yep. catches up on you. Just be honest, whether it's um, telling the owner 
as it is about a horse look it's not as good as we think and yeah it's showed showed us some ability but it hasn't improved like i thought it would a lot, a lot of them will uh, not like what you're saying and in, uh, probably the most important thing is don't close the door um, there'll be a lot of people upset you and there will a lot of people who question you as a young person whether you're a horse trainer or not um, whether you're right or wrong don't close the door don't get grumpy because they'll end up knocking on your door and come back because they'll they'll see that the way that you've 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 respected them when they've left you uh, they'll follow your career and they'll come back if you don't upset them that's so true, Chris. And we've just obviously COVID-19 over here has been pretty disruptive and a lot of people losing jobs. And I've had that piece of advice from a lot of people I trust by now. It's just you don't want to close a door because you never know when you're going to need someone. Look, we received a small novel from a bloke by the name of Belts. And I've tried to summarize it best as possible here. It's about very elegant, three-year-old with raw ability, not heaps of race manners, narrow polished racehorse and still has that X factor. We talked about one of that, uh, just a great race ran last weekend. Have you got to the bottom of her yet, or is there another level you think this horse can get to? I think there's another level, and I hope there is in the spring. Um, and why I say that, she's a New Zealand bred horse. They keep improving. She's only just two. Well, she's only four. Um, this has been her best prep, yet she's already won group one races as a three-year-old, but she's now doing it against the older horses. So um, physically, she's a pretty narrow lighter framed horse but now she started to develop finally and um i think as a late late four-year-old she's just starting to get there but as a five-year-old you even see better so I, I hope and i don't think we have um seen the best from her yet and we hope to see that in the spring and a little bit of relief from the handicapper and a core field of melbourne cut we'll see her fighting out the finish wow well, there you go what about nature strip mate Nature ship's flying. He's um, he'll go close to being the horse of the year, I think. So Whoops. that'll be that'll be good. Good on the back of um, on Winks the last few years. Uh, so we'll just have to see how it's seen and in, in all the the judges' eyes. But um, he's been a revelation. He's won I think four Group One races in the last twelve calendar months, and he's winning the big races. Um, and he's not just winning them. He's He's dead set annihilating them. So he's gradually matured and learned his craft and running a strong 1200 now and doing it at weight for age level. And I'd say he'd be the early and short price favourite for for the Everest in, in the spring. And that'll be his his target. We'll go third up into that. I think third up's when he race, races best. First couple, he's always a bit fresh. Um, but the further he and deeper gets into a prep, he's, he's one hell of an animal. We've got your mate Steve Hansen shag on next week, uh, Chris. Obviously a keen interest in Nature Strip. Is there anything you want to ask Steve through us? Um, it can either be anonymously. I mean, I know you're a rugby fan. Is there anything you want to know? Or do you, do you, would you like him to buy into another horse? Is there something you want to get on the table? <laughs> uh, come, come and coach the Wallabies. This is probably a good start. <laughs> oh, um, you wouldn't care about the Wallabies. I think come on. It'll only be a matter of time before they before they have a go at Dave Rennie, and uh, uh, yeah, it's in a pretty pretty poor. And there you go, rugby in Australia, and rugby in New Zealand, and racing in both countries. Like, how could how could it be so no different? So the all the best for the for um, the the Wallabies getting up and going. But gee, Steve Hansen, he's all class. I've spoken to him a few times, and gee, he's he's one hell of a decent human being. And the advice that, well, not I wouldn't say the advice he gives, but the the, the the common sense approach that that he that he portrays things and and relays things to you, is quite remarkable. And I was very surprised um, each and every time I speak to him because he's a straight shooter, and you say I'm humble. Well, I think he takes it to heart. He's a he's a real decent Kiwi. Well, speaking of being humble, another one of my classic true or false questions. I had a bit of info from one of the viewers that when you do go back to Foxton, you don't mind frequenting the fish and chip store with hundred dollar notes. Is that true? <laughs> uh, first part of it's true. Uh, Conmar, yeah, he's got the the fish and chip shop there, and he does a great job. Loves a punt. 
Um, <laughs> that'd be the main reason I go there. But uh, I don't know about hundred dollar notes. I don't even know what colour they are in New Zealand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it sounds good. Yeah, I was a bit off with my oil there, but uh, no, that's that's good to know. <laughs> you, and you, are you allowed to have a pump? Like, do you have the old pump, or is that like you're not allowed to do that? Do I bet? Yeah. Um, I don't think it would be seen the right thing to do. I used to, uh, but not big because I couldn't afford it. Simple as that. And I found the trainers that do punt uh, can quite often be training their horses a bit differently. And I just find it best to, to win when they win and lose when they lose. But So that time you're not missing out. And you're not losing twice because it's a kick in the guts when your horse gets beat, whether it's favourite or whether you've backed it. Um, and I take it personally and you, you you go away and try and reassess why what went wrong and what you can do to improve. And I just think the gambling side of things for a trainer uh, makes it a bit hard. And, and when you've got multiple runners in a race and you're seeing your yahooing when, when a, one of your horses wins, well, if you've got four in the race, the other three have got beat, so doesn't look good when those owners are watching you and I'm sure if you had had a, a decent investment on it it would change your emotions and you'd be riding one horse harder than the other so was that so I try to steer, steer clear I'll have a bet on Hong Kong races or uh, on a Sunday or if there's a meeting on in New Zealand I um, uh, might have a, an occasional bet if I know a horse or something like that so I'm a hobby punter but certainly not not when I'll yeah, um, got horses racing in the races, or I couldn't tell you the last bit I had to tell you the truth. No, it's a, it's a pretty solid ethos, to be honest, Chris. And um, yeah, no, very professional. Look, one last one from me. You've been so good with your time, and you know it's probably not far away from your bedtime soon. So we better let you get out of here and drink a tin and get to sleep. Uh, one one jockey to win a race. You've you've been involved with many good jockeys. You got the young gun J Mac over there. Obviously, you and Hugh. I mean, that, that bond. You've got one jockey to win a race. Who do you take? Um, throughout my career, um, Darren Beedman was, I think, unbelievable. Whether it be a midweek race at Canterbury or whether it be a Group 1 race, not that he ever won a Group 1 for me, uh, he was just unbelievable. Uh, wow. Big races, I think Hugh, Hugh Bowman is very consistent. James, I think um, he will become one of Australia's greatest riders. Uh, and if he's not parallel to Hugh Bowman already, uh, at some stage he will be. And I'm very lucky to have those two doing most of my riding. Um, but gee, I'll take my hat off to those jockeys going around in New Zealand. Um, Someone that like Lisa Allpress, the miles she does and wow. what she what she's done throughout her career is great. And the early thinnesses for the what what they do to look after their weight. Opie Bossen, he shows week in week out. He can fit it with the Australians, and he's got weight problems. Noel Harris, he rode my first winner, um, and I was in awe of him as a kid growing up, and he did it for so long. So gee. They're, they're, they're amazing sportsmen, these, these guys and girls. And um, they often cop a bit of criticism, but I appreciate all of them that, that work hard from Kimber on a Saturday through to their raw round tomorrow. Oh, that's probably brilliant. We, we think we're going to get an addition to the stable uh, with a, a Savabile cult that we actually pinhooked at the sales that go racing ended up buying. Yeah, so. Right. Yeah, so will we be allowed to come and have a couple of pats at some stage over there? Yeah, for sure, but he needs gilding. He needs gilding. Oh, is that Louis? Oh, that's the seven wheel. Yeah, <laughs> just, to, just, just to just to kill just to kill just to kill the dream. No, I, I I don't know much about the horse, but I've heard from uh, from Go Racing, who uh, one of the first supporters of me, City Red Boxer. I've heard that he's a very nice horse, and uh, he, they said you should be very privileged to be involved in their team. That's oh, savage. Not, that's not you, Luke. That's savage. Oh. Um, <laughs> just to just to clarify, Chris. Look, we we'd love to catch up. We'd love to see you over there at some stage, and and when you're back in New Zealand, get you in a room with some boys. Get paid. Uh, you know, 
the community it's just look we admire what you do so much and just even the fact you've given us so much your time today it shows that you're not afraid to give back to where you come from and and that, and that goes a mile so thank you so much um I, luke any any well done. well done to you guys well done to you guys um what you guys are doing is showing that you can get uh, a footprint and be seen and i'd be i'd be challenging you guys to to make sure you go and see the prime minister and explain who you are they these people they are people they they can be approached and i think new zealand racing just see it as too hard um you need to be able to get in their faces doing it the right way and just sit down and say look this is what we've got to offer give us a chance and i know the trainers association does it here they'll go into the local parliament of new south wales and they'll sit down and it's amazing the amount of people at least in Australian politics, who actually do care about racing and want to know more about it. So that's my challenge to you boys. Get out there, get to the beehive and start um, start arranging some meetings because it is their job to make sure that you can be heard. Don't just go through your parliament. Just go door knocking and, and go and see these people and tell them what good racing can do for the economy, for, for the society, and then you'll be remembered. What a bloody challenge. Outstanding. Chris Wallace surfed it up. Can anyone send through Jacinda's address? I'm going to have to nip around there. I'll come <laughs> door and door on level one and we'll sort this out. But, hey, thanks, thanks for your time. We, like we said, we all admire you. And you know, I think a lot of us have pulled inspiration from some of the things that you've done. Um, and, and I hope that means a lot to you. And you know, you've done a lot for us as well. Um, we've got Hugh Bowman still, still to auction off at some stage. And we're going to do some cool stuff and the funds from that. And yeah, I think for us, it's about paying respect back to people in the industry including yourself and so yeah, we want to try and do as much as we can well done guys thanks chris there we go awesome what an effort that was um luke i think i think i think, I think we've we've dumped chris out there sorry mate uh we're we'll, uh, we we'll, gonna bring him are we, are we gonna bring him back in no, 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 no. no. My pleasure, that's, my pleasure. That's, that's all right. <laughs> see, you, see you, mate. Look, what a, what an absolute champion of a bloke, lads. Did that not just give you tingles listening to some of those things you were saying about working hard, being seen? I mean, if, if you can't take inspiration from that, check yourself. Yeah, yeah, do it. Oh, how's the challenge at the end there? Outstanding and bloody brilliant. This, this rip into it. He makes a, makes a really good point. And just, uh, just a very calm bloke, eh, which I think he talked to same sort of characteristics with um steve hansen so yeah the common themes there right eh? yeah it, it, oh you go louis no no you go benny oh you go louis i have a drink okay uh yes absolutely i was just gonna say absolutely oh, there you go back to you ben yeah um the humility of the guy you know being so humble to be in a position to to have winks and just take it all on the stride like he said when you're in a position when you've got a horse like that I think, you know, you respect there's a certain responsibility that you have to the people and to the media to actually step up and, and play the role of having to answer all the questions and do all that bullshit, you know, that you probably don't want to do. So it's awesome that he can kind of understand that position, especially coming from a place maybe like New Zealand or Foxton where you don't usually get exposed to that kind of, um, I guess, pressure from the media. So many fucking cameras in your face, man. Yeah, 100%. It's he knew his role as well and he knows he understands the, the look he's a he's a successful trainer he understands that he can the, the, the way he compartmentalizes his job and and you know when when he'd go out like he said he had to go out to these press conferences just because he had to be seen with winks um and you know that's just part of the job the media is important would put a horn on a jellyfish watching that inspiring stuff lads cheers chris i don't know what that means but i think it's good there's a lot of positive energy floating around. It's bloody good to see. If anyone, as always, has any suggestions about who else they would like to see, uh, then let us know. Of course, next Thursday, tell the story about what nearly happened yesterday, Louis. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, actually, thank you to everybody that's been sending in your questions and sending sending in your your request to who you want to hear from. It, it, look, we're not Luke doesn't just bullshit to get likes when he says the community is the community. He's he's being for real. Um, we we couldn't do it without you guys. So thank you for everyone that commented and tuned in today. Uh, next Thursday, so we had a little bit of Vincent, Steve Hansen. 
Look, it might have been some poor piss poor communication from me. He actually thought, I think he thought we might, we might have been going live yesterday. So we nearly had to do an impromptu session with Coach Shag. But uh, being the humble and genuine bloke he is, he said, no, look, don't worry, we'll catch you next Thursday. So we've gone Chris Waller. We went Baz McCullum last Tuesday, Chris Waller this Thursday. We're rolling into Shag next Thursday. Anyone else? Just, just, we'll probably get just in there on by the end of this. This is the fucking week after that. Let's rumble. Oh, baby. Rhino said he's going to charge the steps of Parliament. Let's do it. <laughs> fucking equal. We'll better send him a BTP flag, mate, so he's wearing that around him. Yeah. Well, have we... how... Here you go, Luke. Well, no, I just said, how, how good was that? Bloody good. Uh, yeah, it's exciting. It's, I, I liked, um, as well, when you talked about New Zealand racing, like a lot of people over here, they kind of have to dance around what they talk about because they're worried about what someone's going to say, etc. But, like, he doesn't have to do that. Um, which is, you know, so then you can get some honesty. It's just like, fuck, it's disappointing that it's not up to the standard that it should be, and that, and that hurts me. Like, that's what people do want to hear, but, you know, not like, oh, well, you know, I think we can blah, blah, blah. And, you know, oh, okay. So, yeah. So uh, when you started drawing parallels between um, rugby, how, how, how ahead we are in terms of, like, our, our All Blacks team versus the Wallabies, and I... I couldn't help but feel like he was drawing a parallel towards we were like that, you know, 20 years ago, like you said, with New Zealand racing. Eventually they caught up and we just have gone backwards and that could exactly happen with, with the rugby side of things. Aussie racing got Winks and we got Sonny Bill Williams, you know, so it's just, it's really just, God, it's just made it even worse, isn't it? But yeah. Two- yeah, I know who I'd rather spend a day with. Um <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely winks look what a fantastic what a fantastic bloke again thank you so much everyone for tuning in uh oh, wow <laughs> tony fox there's a lot X-rated. going on that's up in the <laughs> that one yeah 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 that's uh we're firmly in the happy hour lads what are you guys doing for the weekend just a few more brews what are we you gonna well, have I'll, I'll put fucking 10k on pier out of the place but i'm <laughs> I mean, would we go live and just watch a couple anyway, just because, you know, it's what we've been doing the last couple of weeks. I'm actually, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm actually involved in a beer pong tournament in isolation. So a bloke, a friend of mine has organized 32 different people to make a bracket. So they like, you live stream it and you shoot at a cup. There's no one at the other end of the table, but they're shooting at their end and you kind of just take your cup. So I think that's a great bit of innovation to get a group of mates together. So shout out to Sam Watkins. But yeah, I'll definitely be watching the racing and I'll probably slam up a quick thinker into pair out of the place, I think. God, it'd be good to be 20 again. Um, quick thinker. Whew. Again and again and again. I don't know why. We go back. Keep going back to the well. What's the weather doing over there? Anyone know? Is it going to be soft track? Is Shared Ambition the one that Waller was tipping, right? Yeah. Cor- correct. Yeah, I'd have booked $2.70 from memory. Hey, is race eight being today at the Gold Coast? I think Baina Girl looks to be on top of that race, and Stable seem to be confident. Wow. Okay. Uh, yes, it has been, and... Yes, it won. Oh, oh yeah. Fuck. Okay, that's poor for me. Oh, that's... Oh, wow. Sorry, oh. but it jumped, uh, jumped midstream. Fuck, why did we go Why did we go so long with Chris Waller when we could have punted race out of the cold coast? Mate, this opened, yeah. like two, this opened 280 when I had a look yesterday and got crunched into about 245. So I just couldn't bring myself to have a bet. Like, everything I touched, <laughs> you rolled out. I'm not doing it. Like, oh, is that right? Who do you like in the weekend? A hundred on at threes, you know. I'm like, fuck it. It's just I just can't do it, you know. I don't even need three hundred compared to the fighting I'm taking. I just I can't take another second. I think your landlord needs a three hundred, mate. Hundred percent, yeah, hundred percent. I'm on Tafane this weekend. Each way, great bet. I was going to say as well, mate. What do, what do you think of his feedback on um, Star of Seas? Doesn't oh. sound like he's going to win a Group One, but he's going to get lots of good. Prize money. <laughs> you need everything to get away, but you know, keep him in your black book. He's a sound horse. He'll pop up every now and then and get you at Pfizer Place. Very elegant, a great place bit. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Man. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Monday oh. next, but... uh, and Belts, I hope you got that. That it's a cup source. I know you wanted to know whether Cox play always at a Caulfield and Melbourne Cup. It sounds like the 2021 Melbourne Cup, we'd be looking at very elegant. Five no, job, just for Hugh Chapman, um, I'll be getting through a couple of beers on here, mate, so I don't think it's just the same beer, just so I can save face. <laughs> well, cool. Yeah, Beltsy's only got 3G at his uh, joint, his farm there on uh, Waverley, so he's, he's got to sit in the corner to watch on 4G to actually be able to stream the live video, and he said he was going to knock off the farm, get a couple of 
beers in the in the fridge and pop them off in the corner. So outstanding. Hopefully Belsey is tuned in. Otherwise, if not, we need to sort them out some sort of rural connection. We'll, we'll, we'll clip this up and we'll put it on the podcast. As I always say, go and sh- like and share our podcast feeds. Go to our Twitter, share it. The more reach we can get, you'll be doing Chris Waller a favour because you can clearly tell he wants us to go up to Parliament and uh, start making some change. So we'll take that upon ourselves. Any parting wisdom from you lads or do I get back to my day job? Oh, just quickly for me, Jason Paris, if you're watching this, mate, hook belts out with a little 4G mobile <laughs> broadband kit in the rural sectors. It'd be fantastic. Luke, off to you. Yep, no problem, Jay. So I'll even drive it down there. Are we allowed to drive? We're not allowed to drive at the moment now, especially after this. Extend, no, extend that bubble, mate. You'll be fine. Some three wise birds. Thanks for sending the pineapple side of through for the boys as well. Outstanding from them. Special edition. Uh, no, nah, just a, another hell of a session. I think there, there's so much to learn from these people. I'm that's, I'm enjoying that side of it. That it's not just a bit of shit chat. Like it's actually there's some real valuable content that I think people can apply to things outside of racing. So uh, a privilege to be a part of. Yeah, I, th- I really enjoy the um, the environment of talking to these people. It's not like a structured interview where it's edited afterwards. It's literally just sitting down, talking, whatever they say they say. And, and you know, I don't feel like anyone's really holding back, which is awesome. Who knew we needed a pandemic and a lockdown to make us do this? I know. I Literally, this sounds a little bit full on, but I sat there thinking one day. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Should we go offline before we do this? Or? One day when I'm still trying to find out if Jesus was an active human or not, talking to my <laughs> grandkids about it i'll be like mate fuck off we interviewed chris waller one day oh fuck off granddad you're full of shit oh how, how about this mate jump on you you jubin or whatever it is by then and shit there we are the boys of chris waller were like oh my god you're embarrassing like fucking oath but how good is that you got waller on yeah 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 same actually in broadcast awesome. uh yeah minus <laughs> 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 Ladies. <laughs>